Welcome to the video podcast Bible study ministry of Dr. David Copeland. This ministry is a production of First Love Visions Productions. Thank you for tuning to this channel and please visit our website at drcopeland.org. Now, let's study God's Word. Welcome to First Love Visions. Today is August the 3rd, 2022. And uh, for those of you that uh, normally check in with this, I hope you'll be willing to turn in your Bible to chapter 3 of the book of Revelations. And uh, it's, it's an interesting study. We're finishing here. You might say that this is the beginning of the end because we're going to look here at the seventh church. And many who believe in the chronology of the book of Revelation letters to the churches or I, I should say maybe an implied chronology, is that the book of Laodicea, uh, or the La La Laodicean church, was uh, kind of a, a, if you look at a timeline beginning with the very first to this one, you, you, would, you would understand it to say that it's a church of today. And, and I don't mind that too much. I, 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 it's, it's stretching scripture just a little bit, but at the same time, there are some, I think that it's illustrative of what we really see today. Whenever I begin to read this, you'll, you'll understand it a little bit better whenever we talk about this. So if this is red letters in your Bible. It's, it's, again, it's Revelation chapter 3. And uh, it begins, actually, the, the letter itself or the, or the beginning of the letter. It begins in verse 14 of chapter 3. To the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, The Amen the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know your works. He says that often, doesn't he, to the churches, and we need to be aware that, that he really does. Um, he knows us. He knows our church. He knows our work. He knows our heart. And, uh, you, you know, you say, well, I, what can I do about that? Well, we can renew our minds, and God wants us to be doing that all the time. And you can do that a lot of different ways. The primary way, I think, is... Uh, it, it has to begin with a, a relationship with God. And so just let me say here as we're looking at this last letter before we get into the apocalypse itself, that, that this last letter to, of the church or, or from Jesus to the church, uh, the one that calls himself the amen, the faithful and the true witness. Uh, if you go back, by the way, to the, to the uh, Greek rendering of the Bible, that actually King James was taken from whenever they were working through that uh, back in 1600s, then you would find that the amen is actually in the Greek a, a, a word that's kind of followed up with the faithful and true witness. It, it essentially means the same thing. It's, so so he's, he's referring to himself here as, as, as the faithful and true witness and the amen. He, he goes on the beginning of the creation of God. Now, why would he bring that in there? I think that it's important to recognize when you begin to look at, even in the New Testament, in our study of, of Christology, which is the study of Christ, when you begin to study about Christ, you can't, you can't say you believe in the Christ of the Bible if you don't believe in the creation of the Bible. Because to put doubt in one thing would be to put doubt on another thing. So a lot of folks out there saying, well, you know, I, I believe in Jesus Christ and I believe in salvation, that kind of thing. But I don't believe in many of those other things. And yet that's how he identifies himself, the beginning of the creation of God. That doesn't mean that he's, he is, uh, that God created him. And I'm sorry to say to those who follow the uh, Jehovah's Witness doctrine, you know, he was not created. He was the creator. Go back and read John chapter 1. In the beginning was the Word. Capital W was the Word. He was in the beginning. In the beginning with God. And he was God. So, you know, you can't say that he was created by God because God doesn't create God. God creates creation. And Jesus is and was and forever shall be God. So here in the, and, and I, I don't want to belabor verse 14 too much here, but he is called, he calls himself the beginning of the creation of God. Then he goes on, he says, I know your deeds, that you're neither hot or cold. I wish you were hot or cold. So because you are lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I will spew you, you know, uh, actually the, in the Greek, literally vomit you out of my mouth. Uh, in this city, it's interesting, whenever I read secular history about it, was that there was two water sources there. One 
was a freshwater source from a nearby town. And then there was another source that came from uh, a, a mineral water source. Now, mineral water has some, some good stuff about it. People used to go out to Arkansas and even out further out west. And there was even a place here in Tennessee at some point where there was mineral springs. People would go there to bathe in it. And you bathe in it, but you really didn't want to drink it too much. And if you've ever bought any mineral water, there may be a rare person out there that likes mineral water, but I got to tell you, you know, I, I don't like it. It's, it's nasty, and uh, it, it will literally make me throw up if I try to drink it. So th th those water supplies came in to Laodicea. One of them was pretty cool because it was coming from springs and it was nearby, and the one with mineral water was actually piped in with some aqueducts from a long way off. So I guess I'm saying that to say this, this – uh, I don't know, this, this illustration, if you will, that Jesus is using here about the lukewarmness of this church, they would know where that was coming from. It would be a local thing. It, you know, it's kind of like Jesus teaching about sheep. There were sheep on the hillside there. People knew about sheep whenever they were teaching about sheep. These people knew what he was talking about when he was talking about this water. And he, know, he knows them. He said, because you're lukewarm, you're neither hot nor cold. Now, this has been misinterpreted time and time again, you know, with people who would say, well, we're, we're talking spew you out of my mouth. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to spew the church members. I'm going to spew these. They've been saved, but they're going to be lost now. And, and it's not at all like that. And, and I'm, I want to try to. Uh, he is the faithful and true witness. So what we got to do is, is, is look to see what in the world's going on. You realize whenever you look at what he's talking about here, that he's, he's speaking in, in hyperbole. It's a metaphor, and, and I don't want to get too far there, but after having taught English for many years, I think everybody needs to know what a hyperbole is. It's, we're talking about something that's overstated, and, and we find that in the Bible quite often, you know, in talking about maybe death and dying, you know. Well, if man died in the Garden of Eden, but he was still breathing, right? So you could call that hyperbole, or you can spiritualize it, or whatever you want to. Jesus is speaking about their spiritual condition when he's talking about them being poor because they weren't poor. This was a rich church. Laodicea was a place where it was, it was known to be uh, wealthy. There was a lot going on there. They, he says, you're naked. Well, they had clothes on. You know that they weren't running around naked there, not really. So it's hyper, that's, that's hyperbole. And so, so I just say that to say that that whenever he's speaking to this church here, when he's talking about being poor or being blind or being wretched, he's talking about a spiritual poverty here, and, and it's a failure. It's a failure on their part to, to be a part of the kingdom and to share in, 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 who, in, in Christ and to be a part of Christ, to have that humility, if you will. You know, they thought that they didn't need anything. You know, as in part of the history, I remember reading that in, in the city of Laodicea, I believe it was an earthquake, or they had some physical calamity happen to their city, and it was destroyed. And so the Roman government was willing to come in and give them money, kind of a welfare thing, and, and uh, help them out, and they refused it. They thought, and they paid for it themselves because there was a lot of very wealthy families there. And so, you know, I'm just saying this was a church and a city that really felt that they were kind of big shots and you may have been to a church like that where folks need nothing they don't think they're needing nothing the city was wealthy the church was wealthy and uh it was out of keeping a little bit with the other churches i think if you read the new testament in in particular but anyway you had this church there that was there and from a spiritual perspective you had as in all churches in this church building in this so-called church group you have believers and you have unbelievers all right, you, you need to get that in your notes. Then in every congregation, there are believers and there are unbelievers. I know you'd like to say, well, you know, there's not any unbelievers in my church. But honestly, I think that the Bible's pretty clear that more than likely there is. And what is a true believer? A true believer, according to Romans 8, is one who has been indwelt by the Holy Spirit. And you can't see the Spirit. You can see the life that they live and so he's talking to a church here, a group of people, and he's talking about unbelief because obviously there must have been some kind of large contingency of people there in this congregation 
that obviously uh, it was it was unbelief, and it's, and and if they weren't believers, then they were unbelievers. Amen. And so it's hard to recognize that, but but the danger in it, we lower our guard, do we not? Whenever we feel like someone is is a Christian, or if they say they're a Christian, and as a pastor of of, of nearly forty years, I can say to you do this whenever I'm talking with somebody I can't judge them if they say that they have been born again if they say that they have accepted Christ as their savior you know that's the end of it with me I'm not going to sit and say well I don't think that you have because you didn't do it my way or you because there's no specific way you don't have to walk up in a church to be saved you know I believe that if you are saved more than likely you will probably walk up in a church because we want to make those kinds of things public and I think that a lot of Baptist churches, we require that at Baptist, but in, in some other congregations as well. But we do. We lower our guard. And, 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 and if somebody is, is truly unsaved, the Bible has some, quite a bit to say about that whenever you dig into it. And uh, it's really a wolf in sheep's clothing. You say, well, there's some good people that are unsaved. There really are. But if they're unsaved, God is not controlling their lives. The flesh, the world, and the devil is. And so for believers in the church, they are influenced. The world outside is influenced by people who say that they are unbeliever, that they are believers whenever they were actually unbelievers. So when you and, and, and being in the same congregation, being in the same family quite often, you can have this, you know, you can have this false sense of security. Here. Now, what's Jesus mean whenever he says that he would rather a church be hot or cold? He's, he's, he's saying here that he wants a, a believer, uh, a, a, rather an unbeliever, to go ahead and be cold. He, if somebody, if, you go, if you're an unbeliever, say you're an unbeliever. Go ahead and be an unbeliever. You're better off that way. Why? Because you can be saved from that. You know, that's what Christ died on the cross for. And, and why we give invitations. And when I go to a church, I never go to a church without giving an invitation. You know, and it's kind of old-fashioned, some people would say, and even a lot of my Baptist friends say, say, you don't have to do that. I probably don't have to do that. I choose to do that because I choose to give people an opportunity to make that decision. And you have that decision, you have that decision to make, and you have that opportunity to make it because I seldom do a blog without saying publicly, that Jesus died for you, and you have to admit that you're a sinner, it's ABC's of salvation, believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, and that he is who he said that he is, and that he says what he means, and he means what he says. And then C is for confession, because once you admit you're a sinner and you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, you will confess him before men. Not necessarily just confess your sin, but confess him, meaning that you are on his side. In other words, you agree with God. And whenever you're that state of mind, God agrees with you. So you have that you have that as a foundation for everything else in your Christian life. It's where you start. That's where you become a part of the church. And uh, and and we all need to be a part of other believers. And I know sometimes that's hard. I had a conversation with a very close friend of mine yesterday, and we kind of debated that a little bit. But, but I'm convinced that when you are a born-again child of God, you have, the, you have this thing filled in your heart where God lives there. But can I say to you that there's another part that, that needs to be filled, and that's that part that has to do with the other believers in Christ. We all need to be a part of that ecclesia. You really are a part of it, whether you know it or not, but we need to be a part of it. We need to be edifying our friends and our brothers, and that's also how we grow in Christ. It's one of the one of the terrible things that I've noticed that is that so many people around our part of the state, they've been in church, they've got their feelings hurt or got the chip knocked off their shoulder or 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 their pettiness has been bruised or whatever, and they've gotten out of church and never gotten back into it. And it's interesting how we justify those things, isn't it? And uh, whenever you do justify it, I don't know how you justify it. I could justify just about anything my, uh, my wife tells me. But, but I, I, can, I, I, I justify it and have justified it by saying, well, you know, I, there's hypocrites out there in the church, and I don't want to go to church with hypocrites. Can I just say to you that every church around probably has hypocrites? And, and, if, and if, you don't go, if you go to a church where there's hypocrites, guess what? There's probably going to be one more there. And I don't say that 
to be mean. I'm just simply saying it because of truth, because we all are hypocritical sometimes in our attitudes, and it's all about how you and I want to act. And uh, Jesus wants somebody to be uh, either believing wholeheartedly in the church, working out his or her salvation in Christ and doing what God wants him to do and being led of the Spirit, or he wants you to go ahead and admit that you're a sinner and that you're lost. Because the problem is for someone who's in the middle of that, for someone who either thinks that maybe they're saved because of they were born into it, or maybe you think you've been saved because you're, you're a good, good person, that you haven't really done a whole lot of bad in your life. And, and uh, you know, I've never been to jail. You know, I've never killed anyone. I don't steal. I might cheat on my taxes a little or something like that, but I don't really do a whole lot of bad and I don't do as bad as that guy that's a deacon down there at the church that claims all those things. Did you know that's not going to cut it whenever you stand before God someday? And Jesus would prefer for you to just be, go ahead and be an unbeliever. And that's what he's talking about. He prefers either of these two states to luke lukewarmness. It's better to be cold and acknowledged unbeliever than to be lukewarm thinking you're a believer or, or claiming you're a believer and either way being not a, a believer so, you know, they don't, uh, uh, you know, someone who's lukewarm don't even realize, you know, what they're missing, what they don't have oftentimes. But listen to what it says in Matthew chapter 7 in verse 21 and 22 and 23. Not everyone, this is Jesus speaking, by the way, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven will enter. In Matthew 7, 22, many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? Listen to this. And in your name cast out demons? And in your name perform many miracles? Is that not unbelievable? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. See, there's, there's folks out there that are in church groups who don't believe to Jesus, to belong to the Lord. And, and he said, I'm going to spit you out of my mouth, you know. And so I, I don't want to, there's something interesting about this letter that's unlike all the other letters. And here it is. There is no condemnation, period. Nothing positive said about this church of Laodicea. I, I'm, I'm, I'm troubled a little bit by something that I'm pretty much convinced of, and that is that the church of Laodicea is an illustration, it's a metaphor, if you will, of the church of 2022. And perhaps even the church for their own, if the Lord tarries. Jesus could come back today for his church. And we're going to talk about that more in our next lesson because we're going to, we're, it's going to major on the rapture and because that's what chapter 4 really is all about in starting that. But I, I want to say to you that you know, if, if the rapture were occurred today, you need, to, you need to be honest with yourself and say, would I be here or would I not? Would he come and get me? Not because of what I've done or haven't done, but because of what Jesus has done. Have I trusted in him as my Savior? And that's what that is all about. So, so what does he say here then? He, he goes on down here in the lower part of these verses that I read to you a minute ago, and he advises them, to obtain something. He says, buy from Christ, from me, he says, gold refined by the fire, and buy white garments. Now, of course, you know, again, this is metaphorical. You know, this is uh, uh, hyperbole, if, hyperbole if, you, if you will, but, but it's, he's talking about them, the things that they need, okay? There is a remedy to sin, and there is a remedy to lostness. And so he's putting this in a picture that's, that's understandable for the most simple of us, honestly. He's, he wants us to get gold, something valuable. What is the most valuable thing around? We think gold or diamonds or something like that, right? No. In the spiritual, in, in any reality, salvation is the most valuable. God himself actually is the treasure of all treasures. And if you have him, you... You have everything. But he says to buy white garments. That, that's indicative of purity. That's illustrative, illustrative of purity. 
you know. And they need, he says they need eye salve to see. That was another one of the industries that had made this place wealthy here was eye salve. People would have infections in their eyes and they, they, they made a salve here that you could rub on that to, to help draw some of that sickness out of, out of your eyes. And so, so that was one of the things that he brings that up here to use this as a spiritual lesson. It's so interesting. And Je there's nobody like Jesus for using parables and for, for doing illustrations. Can I say to you that the, this church was relying on what it could do and what it had, its own wisdom. What a dangerous thing for us to do. What should they have been doing? They should have been lifting up their, their pleas to heaven for help. And that's what he's saying they need to do. He's exhorting them. He's challenging them to repent, isn't he? You know, it's uh, those that are truly the Lord's, those of us who are born again, children of God, when we get out of line, guess what? There is a discipline that the Lord has for us, and it's not a pleasant thing. And those of you who are born again and you're listening to this, you probably know what I'm talking about. But there is a thing, the, the, old te the, uh, new, the King James Version calls it chastening. It goes on to say that if a child of God hasn't been chastened, you're really maybe not a child of God at all. And so I, I, I have been chastened in my life. And God takes care of those things in his children that doesn't need to be there, right? Or he, he puts things in your life that needs to be there. And sometimes those things are uncomfortable, it says in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 6, those whom the Lord loves, he disciplines, he chastens, and he scourges every son whom he receives. And then verse 7, it's for discipline that you endure. God deals with you as with sons. And what son is there whom his father does not discipline? And verse 11 of Hebrews chapter 12 says, all discipline for the moment seems anything but joyful. That's a Copeland translation there. Anything but joyful, but sorrowful. Yet to those who have been trained by it, afterward it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness. So after he exhorts the church there in verse 20, he calls this church to faith. There were, even though he says what he says, it's obvious here that there's still people who are truly born again in this church. Otherwise, they wouldn't actually be the church at all. Do you understand what I'm saying? The church is, is really... The integral church is a body of blood-bought believers. And if there are some folks in there that are not Christians, that are not true believers, that are actors, that are hypocritical, that are whatever, that doesn't change the fact that those that are saved are still the church. You remember the parable that Jesus gave? The, the master sent out his sowers and they sowed the wheat. And then when it began to come up, the servants came rushing back into the master and said, Oh, master, the wheat's coming up, but somebody has sown weeds in amongst it. Tares, it's called in the King James. What are we going to do? Do we go out there and try to pull up the tares? He said, No, you'll tear it all up if you do that. Just leave them in there. Let them grow. And at the judgment, I'll take care of that. Can I say to you that we don't have to worry about that? We don't have to judge people. We can't judge them anyway. We're not supposed to judge them. You're not capable of judging people. But the judge of judges will judge his people. Now, if you read in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, you're going to see over there, and everybody needs to know this chapter, that's a judgment of Christians. It's called the Bema Seat of Christ. It's where we'll be judged for rewards. We'll be given crowns. That's a judgment for his people. It's spoken of at the first resurrection in the book of Revelation we're going to talk about later. The thousand years later, there's going to be another re uh, resurrection. There's going to be a resurrection of the damned and the dead. And that will be the one at the great white throne. You can find that over around chapter 20. We're going to get there. We'll get there eventually. But there's a different judgment for Christians than there is for non-Christians. And that may rub somebody the wrong way. And that's all right. That's because you haven't studied it enough. You need to get in there and take a look at what the Bible teaches us about judgment. Can I say to you, we all will stand in judgment both saved and unsaved. It'll be a different judgment, but guess what? It'll be the same judge. And my judge, that's spoken of a little bit over there in, in the third chapter and other places in the Bible too, will be the Lord Jesus Christ, who is also my Savior. My Savior is my judge, and he saved me. So I, that's a lot of security in that, isn't it? 
And uh, can I say that in this church where there's a lot of unbelief, there's still true belief there in the church there at Laodicea. And uh, he says that it'll, it'll, if it's the last church part of the church age, then that means that we are in the last of the church age. And there's nothing left between us and the rapture at all. The next thing, in fact, we're supposed to be looking for him to come. There's, there's not anything else. I know a lot of people are trying to teach a lot of different things nowadays. But you need to go to your Bible and understand that, that, that their very next thing on the prophetic chronology of the, you know, this, this prophetic calendar that only God has and only God knows is Jesus coming back for his church. And boy, I look forward to that. I look forward to that. So anyway, you have earlier the church, Philadelphia, a faithful believing church, but that's the church of the last era, if you will. There was, you know, I, I caught part of that. I think I was born in the 50s and, and uh, uh, the church that was during that time, I think largely pretty good church. You know, it was, it, was, it was doing a lot of things, winning people to the Lord, sending out missions everywhere. And something has happened in the last several decades. Uh, part of it has to do with the educational process. You know, I, I retired from the local school system here and I believe in education but also that believe that the wrong kind of education can absolutely ruin children. And it can ruin leaders of churches if they're taught things that are wrong and they believe those things. And, uh, I, you know, it worries me a little bit sometimes when I see uh, and hear certain pulpits, and I'm not going to point fingers at anybody this morning. I'm not bashful about it. But I would say to you that, that you just need to be careful where you go, where you get your teaching. Make sure that it's biblical. Be like, be like the uh, folks in, in, uh, in, in Asia whenever Paul came through there preaching. He said that those folks went back to the Bible and studied to see, make sure that what they were teaching was true. That's what you and I need to do. We don't need to just buy into something because it sounds good or because it's sweet or maybe it feels, makes you feel good at the end of the day. Rather than feel good, I would rather know good. I would rather know. Over in 1 John, you know, there's, it said the word K-N-O-W is, is stated so many times over there. That's because God wants you and I to know that we know that we know that we are born again, that we're children of God. We need to know. Why? Because when I know that well, then I'm able to, I'm, I'm inspired, I'm impassioned to not only study and, and learn more, but to be more secure in my faith so that whenever someone asks me, I can tell them what I believe. If you can't tell somebody how to be a Christian and you claim to be a Christian, you should be ashamed of yourself. And if you don't listen to me anymore, that's not any skin off my back, really, because I make no money off this process. But I can tell you this. You need to be careful. Make sure that you are saved, number one. And I don't see how a person could be saved without being at least somewhat curious about what, the, what you bought into whenever you ask Christ into your heart. And can I say to you that there's somewhere over in the New Testament where it says that you don't really need anybody to teach you, that the Holy Spirit will do that. So if the Holy Spirit is living in you, and if you're a born-again child of God, then he does, then he's teaching you or he's trying his best to. Would you surrender to him and let him, let him teach you? Listen to what it says here in 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1, going back a little ways in the Bibles. But the Spirit, capital S here, this is talking about the Holy Spirit, God's Spirit. The Spirit explicitly says that in later times, some will fall away from the faith, paying attention to deceitful spirits and doctrines of demons. And by means of the hypocrisy of liars, seared in their own conscience as with a branding iron. And then in verse 3 there it says, Men who forbid marriage and advocate abstaining from foods which God has created to be gratefully shared, shared in by those who believe and know the truth. We live in days like that, where people are literally lying from the pulpit, who, who people who, who, would, who would get on a pulpit. And I, I remember hearing a sermon a few years ago, uh, a man uh, in, a, in a denomination local, who got up and, and was supposed to give up a, a sermon, a Christian sermon to a group of high school kids that was graduating. 
And he got up and he talked about the grass and he talked about the trees and he talked about greenery and taking care of Mother Earth and all of that. And he never once talked about Jesus. Can I say to you that is hypocrisy? That that's the part of this church that he's talking about right here in Laodicea because there's, it wasn't really a part of the church. Although they were in the church, they were sitting on a pew or they were preaching from or teaching or, or deaconing or, or leading or doing something there in that church. But can I say to you, that person does not have a home in heaven simply because they have never been born again. Folks, it's the easiest thing in the world to trust Jesus, but it's also the hardest thing in the world to trust Jesus. Because to trust Jesus, you have to lay down your humanism, you have to lay down your, your, your flesh, you have to lay aside everything that the world really offers. Now, mind you, God will give you all of that that you, that you want and more, but you have to surrender to him fully. And if you never surrendered, I, I guess it, it could be put like this. I heard it said this way. You know, if, if he's your savior... He's got to be your Lord. But if he's not your Lord, he's probably not your Savior. And I hope that you can chew on that just a little bit because we live in those later times. People are falling away from the faith. But we're not talking about someone losing their salvation. We're talking about these folks that's in church that's never been saved at all. And we have to be very careful about that. People forbidding marriage and abstaining from foods. I will tell you something, we live in a time, and in only recent years we've lived in a time where there's so much money running around out here and people are so capable of going to the grocery store and buying and eating anything they want to. And some folks around here in, in, in our area of the country eat out probably three or four times a week. The restaurant business is doing great. But can I say to you, this is something here talking about, you know, people who are being picky about their foods and that kind of thing. Never in history have, have we been able to do that until now as, as church as a whole. So I think that, that that information alone is meaningful in pointing to what the day is in which we live. It's like no other day in history. He goes on in over in 2 Timothy, 2 Timothy in chapter 3, verse 1, he says, in the last days, difficult times will come. Men be lovers of themselves. Lovers of money, boastful, arrogant, revilers, disobedient to parents, ungrateful, unholy, unloving, irreconcilable, I'm sorry, I'm getting my tongue tied, malicious gossips, without self-control, brutal, haters of good, haters of good, treacherous, reckless, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, holding, listen to this, holding to a form of godliness, although they have denied its power. And what are we supposed to do with people like this, men like this? Avoid such men as these. And these things have been around folks ever since Cain. And Paul says in these last days, they're going to become not the exception. It's going to become the rule. Don't like the idea of living in a world dominated this way, but that's where we're headed. That's where we're headed in the days of the apostate church where there is a thing called a church, but not only will it burn to the ground, but so will those within it. And so in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1, Paul writes to Timothy and to the people that also read that letter, I solemnly charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus who is to judge the living and the dead and by his appearing in his kingdom, preach the word, be ready in season and out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with great patience and instruction. The time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but they want to have their ears tickled and they will accumulate for themselves teachers in accordance to their own desires and will turn away their ears from the truth. What is the truth? He said, your word is truth. The scripture is, is truth. There was, there was just a lot of, goodness, I, I think Paul mentioned, says it better, doctrines of demons everywhere in that early church. Can I say that it's always, it's there too. If you study history, and I'm going to close with this today, and I've gone a little bit over, but I, I think that I needed to. When you're talking about the apostate church, I remember 
uh, reading uh, in, in seminary about the uh, back in the 19th uh, uh, century, we had you had biblical criticism that popped up. And it's okay to be a critique, uh, have a critique of scripture and of any kind of literature like that. But I remember the movement really began back in Germany, where people began to uh, not only interpret scripture loosely and uh, didn't regard any kind of view historically. And, and even to say that its literal meaning really wasn't important at all. Can I tell you, you're supposed to take the book literally unless it's obvious, abundantly obvious, that you're not supposed to. And you started having people coming from that time, and even in U.S. seminaries later on, you know, people questioning the authorship of the books of the Bible and, and questioning things that had always traditionally been known as truth about the Scriptures. And I know that you... The, the, some of my friends, and, and, and I don't disagree with them necessarily, you know, was, would say to me today, I don't use anything but the King James Version of the Bible. Well, I, that's fine. That's fine. I, I, you run into problems with that if you use foreign languages and try to send it to a Chinese believer or something like that. But, but I'm not judging anybody on that. I'm just simply stating you need to know what you believe. We need it because what we believe comes from scripture and if it comes from anywhere else it's not to be believed and we've we've become very progressive in many of the churches the trend today is continuing folks and if you are in a church where the word of god is preached man listen listen pray for that preacher pray for those folks that are teaching the truth there pray for those leaders who are holding strong to the truth and stay away from those that are not if you're in a church where the truth is not being preached Get out of there as fast as your feet can carry you out of that place. Just get out of it. You know, we live in a day of democracy. And everybody wants to say, okay, we're going to vote this way and the majority rules. Can, the majority can be wrong a lot of times. Can I tell you what we should be living in, Christian? Listen to me, Christian. We live under a monarchy. The perfect form of government is a monarchy if you have the right king. Let us pray. Father, thank you, Lord, for this moment. God, we pray for each man, woman, boy, or girl who hears this message, Father, that they might hide that word in their heart. In Jesus' name, amen.